And those of you that have been doing this for a minute, you're strong. You've been laying these bricks for a while. Your foundation is firm. But some of you guys are brand new to this. You're like, man, I don't even know half, I don't even know a third of what that man is talking about up there when he's preaching. But I'm going to tell you, it's not a waste of time to, to zero in and take what you can. To listen, to pray that God will help you. He said something called the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a part of God that we don't even understand, but the Bible describes him as our counselor, our teacher, our guide. And so he is the only one that can help us even understand this stuff from the Scripture. Anyway. So think about that. When you begin to get a God concept in your heart and mind, it's because the Holy Spirit is giving you that as a gift. This is real stuff. It isn't just this like ethereal, like make-believe or mythical spiritual. It is for real. This is actually occurring in your life as God speaks to you. So do what you can. You're tired. You're worn out. You're overloaded. You've been hearing people talk at you all day long. But there's still more. It's kind of like that buffet on Sunday when you think you're done and you can't eat anymore. But then you walk by the dessert and you go, I got it. I got this. I can take a little more soft serve ice cream. You know what I'm talking about? Or they bring out the steak that wasn't quite ready to go. Okay, I gotta have another piece of that steak. Or the shrimp shows up that I'm missing the whole time. Or then you find, you find another gear. You know what I'm talking about? And then I find another gear in his buffet. Okay? Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. Let's continue to sing. Okay. fills a night it cannot hide the light whom shall I fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still whom shall I fear I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind, the God of angel armies is always by my side, the one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine, the God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name. For you alone can save, you will deliver me, yours is a victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. And nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in always by my side the one who reigns forever 
Be seated, but don't be sleeping. Light guy. Lights, 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 lights. Steven, you have one job, sir. Just one job. Well, two jobs. Lights and keeping my daughter completely happy. Those are the only jobs you have. All right. So, some of you have heard the story of Larry the Biker. Larry the Biker is a guy who, um, my dad, in his first church, he had just gone to seminary. He was in seminary, and the first church he pastored was a little bitty church in Chillicothe, Missouri. How many of you have ever visited the big metropolis of Chillicothe, Missouri? You have not. You are making that up. Paige is just making it. What part of the state is it in? Oh, yeah, okay. All right, all right. It's up by Kansas City. And it's a, it's a teeny tiny town, like, like a, just a bug spot on the map. It's really small. And my dad tells this story about how he was preaching, and he hears this noise outside of the church, and the noise gets louder, and a guy rides, it's a little bitty country church, like a little bitty old white frame, kind of like the one you see in pictures, just a little white simple with a steeple and a porch on the front. A guy rides his motorcycle up on the front steps of the church, guns it, and it's like, it's an Indian, it's kind of like a Harley, but it's loud. He guns it a couple of times, kills it, puts the kickstand down, parks the bike right there in the front, right, like not the parking lot, on the front of the church, marches all the way down for the back, and sits right in the front, all in his leathers, he's a big, huge, 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 like, giant biker guy, wearing all of his leather, the back of his motorcycle has a sissy bar on it with a swastika welded in it. This is not like your friendly neighborhood Harley guy who's got too much money and not enough sense. This is like a legit biker. Dad says for about six weeks he would do the same thing every Sunday. It would sort of terrify the old ladies in the congregation. He would march down the aisle, sit up here. On the sixth week or so, he decides that he wants to get saved. And he stands up and he gives his life to the Lord and this big, giant, fearsome mountain of a man gives his life to Jesus Christ. Turning from his wicked ways, recognizing that he is a sinful human being, he has heard what my dad has been talking about as far as Jesus and said, I want some of that preach. I want some of that. And he gives his life to the Lord, not really knowing what that meant, except that he knew he had to be saved. And he responded to the gospel the way many of us have had, from a, a place of just almost nothing. We don't really know what we're getting into. We just know what we're getting out of, right? We know that our life is such a train wreck. And we've seen those around us who have the same kind of lives. And we don't want any of this. And we recognize that there is a God and he loves us. And then we realize how far we are from God because of our choices. And so we're moving from what we know we are into what we hope we can be with God. But we really don't know, right? We really don't know how to live this new life because Jesus is declared to be our Savior, which means he saved you from something. He rescued you. He redeemed you. He did all of those things, that, those church words. But then he is your Lord, which means he is your boss, right? Savior and Lord. And a lot of people get to say, I want Jesus to save me. But they forget about this part about him being the Lord of their life because your boss tells you what to do. And what do you do? You do it, right? If he's your boss, if you said... You're my boss. I've signed a contract. I've taken the job. I'm working for you. Tell me what to do, boss, and we'll go do it. If you're a good employee, you will walk in his footsteps and do. It's even more than that, though. The Lord was the one who literally had authority over you, and Jesus, as your Lord, has authority. You don't question the Lord. You do what he says. And this is where it gets kind of sketchy in modern-day Christianity because it seems like a lot of people are interested in being saved, but not many people are interested in giving up what they've got. So Larry, he followed Jesus out of hell and then into a new life, but he didn't know what to do. My dad said, Larry, we got to talk. We have to talk about your life now in Jesus Christ and how it needs to change from your life when it was in Larry before. By the way, I texted my mom this morning and said, so whatever happened to Larry? Can we check? Is he on like Facebook somewhere? Is it Larry from Chillicothe, the biker? I don't know how you look that up. I don't know how you search for Larry, the guy with the swastika on the back of his bike. But I'm, I've got my mom on this right now. She said, well, Larry's best friend was this pastor, and I'm going to see if she can find it. So my mom is on this. She is trying to find Larry now, some 
50 years after he was saved and find out what's going on in his life, even if he's still alive. I don't know. But I want to find out Larry's story because my dad began to disciple him. What that means is you are mentored and trained by a Christian, somebody who's following Christ, but how to walk as Christ would have you walk. It's not like a list of rules. There's no manual that comes with this. It's not like a Boy Scout handbook. You go in, you memorize some stuff and you earn some merit badges and all that stuff. What it really is, how do I respond in this world as if I was not of this world anymore? How can I act like I am a new creature when I'm in my old body and I'm around my same old situations? Well, Larry was living with his girlfriend, well, sleeping with his girlfriend, living with his mom. He was a grown man, didn't have a job. So he's got his girlfriend on the side, sleeping in his mom's house and riding his motorcycle. He had a good life. My dad said, Larry, we got to talk. Because a man of God doesn't have sex with somebody he's not married to. And a grown man doesn't live off his mom and he gets a job. Larry said, okay, preach. And he goes out and he, he begins to try to follow my dad's guidance to be discipled. He breaks up with his girlfriend. He moves out of his mama's house. He gets a job. His job drove up on the church parsonage lawn. The next week, he was so proud of his new job, he drove it to the parsonage of the church's house. The house that's provided for the pastor by the church. And we lived in the parsonage. And Larry drives up in his brand new Budweiser beer truck that he's driving now. That was his new job. It says parked right in front of the parsonage. He's like, like, I got a job. And my dad said, Larry, I'm proud of you. Now let's talk about what kind of jobs <laughs> might be the best ones to have. And just hearing my dad and mom's story about how this man who was so eager to please God was sorting out how to live his life because it didn't come automatically, right? There are certain things that were like, I mean, I was, uh, uh, Grayson was so bold in his testimony today. He goes, I didn't know this was wrong. But then I found out it was wrong, and I didn't want to do it anymore. I thought that was a profoundly beautiful testimony about how God changes us, right? That's how we're supposed to walk in Christ. Now, I want you to, to think about this a little bit. Many of us are, are glad to have been saved forever. We're just not living in the now as well as we should be. When we die, we're, we're, we're certain of our salvation because Jesus has saved us. But right now, we're kind of stumbling along, and, and this is so much more than fire insurance, you guys. This, this idea of Christianity is so much more than this, this insurance policy that you cash in payable upon death. It's not a get-out-of-hell-free card only, right? It is, a, it is a ticket to a life that is more abundant. He created you in this time, in this place, in this nation, in this society, in your family, jacked up or otherwise around your friends, confused or otherwise, in your place of work, he put you here in this time, in this place, for a meaningful, purposeful life. It is ours to sort out. How do we do these things? What is it that we're supposed to do now that we've been brought out of darkness? What is the life that we're supposed to walk in? How do we know what right and wrong really is when we're so confused by what the world tells us? <coughs> It's right and wrong. And generally speaking, if the world thinks it's good, it ain't. Almost always. You can just about bet on it. If they're telling you something is right, you can almost, the Bible says this, right? That the world will declare things that are wrong to be right and things that are right to be wrong. And we will be declared intolerant and small-minded and immature and haters and bigots because we follow our God. I want you to think a little bit tonight about what it is that we don't just get out of hell, but we are into a life. And I think sometimes it's because we think so small. We don't think big enough. We haven't think. Uh, C.S. Lewis said something I thought was kind of interesting. I think it's very interesting. I don't think he said it in one of these things, though. I think he said it in a, in, a, in a book called The Weight of Glory. And this is what he said. Now, I want you to bear with me for a minute. This is one of my favorite quotes by C.S. Lewis. Because it describes our plight exactly. And I want to give you the context for this. I used to mess with my kids when they were little. I mess with them when they're big now. But I mess with them when they were little. And they would have money. And I would trade them their money for my money. Right? And I could trade them pennies, a penny for their dimes. And they would do it all day long. And sometimes I would trade them a nickel for their dimes. And they would do it all day long. It's like, yeah. Dad's kind of dumb, right? 
because the penny is way bigger than the dime. It's better. And I'm like, yeah, keep trading. Let's go. Right? They were so dumb in that trade. <laughs> They've outgrown that one. I have to be much craftier, but it's an interesting <laughs> thing, right? We do the same thing in this world. We're willing to trade some dumb little stuff for the life of glory God has given us. It's amazing that we will trade the nonsense that we trade right now. Let me give you an example. I will trade, I won't, but we'll say this hypothetically. I will trade like temporary sexual pleasure with my girlfriend for a long life with my best friend, my wife. Who would be faithful to me and me to her to build a strong relationship. I will trade this temporary nonsense for a long life with my spouse. What is that all about? What, what fool would trade this nonsense for this long life with your best friend? I don't know, but it happens all the time, right? It happens all the time. People are willing to trade the temporary for the long term, term eternal. They just swap it out. It's a bowl of soup for your birthright kind of trade all day long. And we can't fall for that stuff. We have to have a better vision. We have to be smarter. This is what C.S. Lewis said when he was dealing with this idea that, that God can't handle our big sins. And he says, I have a different idea. It would seem our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but in fact too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea, we are far too easily pleased. C.S. Lewis had an interesting perspective. He, he could look at those with, with wealth and affluence and power and relationships, but he watched even these people who should know better trade the temporary nonsense of the carnal or physical bodies and those, uh, those little, 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 little pleasures for what they could have had in Christ. Don't fall for that. Don't, don't be fooled by that. Don't trade your dimes for pennies. Don't, don't, don't fall for what the devil would say. You should have this if you want it because he knows that anything you bargain for with him You'll lose. You always lose in the world's game. You always lose when you fall to temptation. You always do. On the other side of this, anytime God has given us boundaries and guidance, it's a guaranteed win. It's a, it's a simple equation. God has only given us guidelines to benefit us. It's for our best interest that he gives us guidelines. So when he says, for example, I've given you the gift of sex, and I'll, I'll attest you, it is a gift, ladies and gentlemen. It is a gift from God. It's not just for procreation. It's great to have kids, but it's for recreation as well. When you are married, this is a fantastic benefit. But outside of being married, it is a destructive force that will tear you and everybody else up around you. And you can't confuse that. God has said this gift in its context, is a gift. And when you mess it up, it will wreck you. He's given us money. It's nice to have money. You can share it with people. You can buy stuff. You can get food you like to eat. You can take trips. Money is awesome. In its context, God provides for us the money that we need, not only for our needs, but in my experience, to benefit others as well. But out of its context, when you are greedy with this or wasteful with your money, you're not a good steward of the things God has given you. It destroys those things that it could be preserving. Our physical health. God has said, I've given you the most amazing Formula One race car bodies you've ever seen. You are resilient. You are tough. It's a self-healing machine. You can train it. You can make it do amazing things. And in its proper use, when the care and feeding of the human body is cared for, you benefit. And when you don't take care of your body, what happens? It messes up. It hurts you. You suffer. All of these things that God has given us can be used in their context. Our minds are 
fearsomely powerful. I mean, we can create things. We can conceive of ideas. We can articulate arguments. We can write songs and paint pictures. We can solve problems and we can build things and we can converse with people. We can learn other languages. We can write music. We can solve mathematical equations. We can develop things that help us to understand the world we observe. And there is seemingly no end to this. You know there's an end to it, but we just keep getting smarter and more. Not every generation we go, this is an incredible thing God has given us, our minds. And yet, many times we let them turn to mush. Learning stuff? Over my dead body, I'm only getting a grade so I can get out of this class. I don't want to learn anything. If I learn something, I might know something. And then I have to do something, and I don't want to do anything. Just let me be a vegetable, please. And pass the Doritos while you're at it, right? And, a, and, a, and a, maybe a monster to go with it so that I can, like, really wreck my body, my mind, and my... You see what we're, our tendencies are, right? And I'm, I'm getting on to all of us because we squander these opportunities to benefit from what God has given us. And he says, you are designed, and I have designed you for, for peace, for shalom in your life. This idea that you can have harmony with other human beings in your family. And for purpose. So when you get up in the morning, you get up and go, ah, i got something to do that has meaning. And I've had dead-end jobs that just drive me crazy. I can tell you God has created you for purpose and meaning. So you wake up, even in the hardest work that you're doing, you find meaning and fulfillment in the hard work that you're doing. And finally, you'll find prosperity in this as well. And it may be financial prosperity. Some people get rich. Some people don't. Most don't. But the prosperity I'm talking about is contentment. At the end of the work week, the end of the week, at the end of the day, you feel good about what you've done and the way you've conducted your life with the skills and abilities and talents God has given you. And I much prefer talking to teenagers over grown people who have already set their trajectory in the wrong way. You can still change things much more readily. You're more nimble. You're more open. You're more unset yet. Your, your concrete has not set yet, right? Your cement, excuse me. Oh, you had it right. Oh, I had it right. I had it right. We use cement to set the concrete. Your concrete, sorry, as an engineer, you got to get it right or you're in trouble. So you're, you're not set. You're still able to form your life. Most grown-ups have already said, no, nah, I'm good. I'm going to go this way. But that's not really good for you. Ah, I'm going to still do it. And it hurts those around them. Peace and prosperity. In uh, Romans 5, when it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Larry was working to find peace. And I wish for you that we would have appetites that made us ravenous for God. The Bible speaks about us having a hunger and thirst after righteousness. The psalmist says that I would, I would like to have a, a, a desperation or a seeking after, a, after God like a deer pants for water. This idea that, that if we had this right, our hunger would be for God. That we wake up going, ah, oh, man, i got to get in my Bible quick. I'm getting wiki shakes right now, right? Man, I have got to pray. I am so thirsty right now. I've got to pray. How often do we do that, right? This is what the Bible says. Now, I was thinking about this. How do we develop that? Well, we develop an appetite for things that we eat. We develop an appetite for things that we eat. That's how it works with us. If we eat a lot of sugar, what do we crave? If I drink a lot of coffee, what do I want? Coffee. We develop an appetite for the thing, or we are craving for the things that we eat anyway. And the appetite is something that is habituated within our bodies. I'm going to tell you right now, some of you don't have this, this appetite. Some of us don't have this appetite for the scripture because we haven't started to devour the scripture. It hasn't begun to sustain us, right? You guys know your favorite foods, your routines. If they are not in your life, you begin to crave these things. And when, when the things of God become our nutrition, we will crave these. It isn't this automatic craving. Most of us don't crave healthy foods. But what I've noticed about people who set their mind and discipline on something healthy, they begin to get a craving for the healthy things. They may be occasionally tempted by the unhealthy things, but they have a craving for the healthy things. Some of you that are athletes, you know about this. You don't like to run. But what you hate even more is not running. It, it's just the way it is. 
I mean, you get up in the morning and think, man, I do not want to run. And if you don't run, you feel worse than if you did run. Because you developed a healthy appetite for these things that you need. When you, when you practice good diet and exercise, we build a strong body. When we have a bad habit, we build a weak body. When we develop strong disciplines in our finances, we develop wealth. It may not be massive prosperity, but we develop flexibility and freedom. And if we don't, then we're bound by our money. We're, we're slaves to our debt. It happens the same way in our physical lives. When we consume social media, and we consume entertainment, we consume sports in an unhealthy way, then we become dependent on it in an unhealthy way, and it results in unhealthy people. But if we manage technology, we manage social networks in a way that brings our mind and our heart and our body into alignment with God, we become healthier people. You know, God has given us all that we have and all we are as a divine gift. And it is up to us what we do with these gifts. I want to find out what's up with Larry. I want to know if he continued to pursue God, if he developed an appetite for the things of the Word, the things of the Father. Because if he did, he lived a life that was transformative. That's how it works. And if he didn't, he lived a life that was just tragically sad because he missed the boat. If I can figure out where he's at, I'll let you guys know. Many times when people are first saved, they're all gung-ho and ready to go. But man, I've got to make some discipline in my life. I've got to do some things. I've got to change some, some ways that I think. I've got to break some old habits. You know, it's in your best interest that you do so. I want you to develop the appetites so these lives are healthy that we've been given. Not just for when we die, but as long as we might live. Father, thank you for these young people. I am so impressed with their ability to focus at 11 o'clock at night. They've been going for 18 hours or so today. Take this energy and take this vitality and take these minds, Father, and form them into the people that you would have them be, forge them into the weapons that you would have them be for your kingdom. Develop them into the talented men and women that they can be. I pray for their potential in you to be realized. That they see what they can, they can do and have and be in you. And the contributions they can give to their families and their churches and the kingdom at large because they are who you've designed them to be. Help them to get a glimpse of that, Father, to see your vision for who they are, for all of us. Lord, help us to see who we could be if we just followed you. And encourage us to pursue you in that way. In your name we pray. Amen. Medicine, table set up. See you in the morning.